Hello, welcome to Global Connections at the Think Tech live streaming network series. I'm your host, Grace Chang, and today we have with us on our program is Professor Frank Wu of the University of California Hastings College of Law. Welcome, Frank. It's great to have you here today. And it's great to be here with you, Grace. Okay. Um, Frank is the author of numerous publications on race and law in the United States, including Yellow, uh, Race in America, Beyond Black and White. Right. And so today we're going to be talking about this topic, uh, race in the United States and how it's changing, what we can expect, um, some, of your, some of your thoughts and hypotheses on this topic. So I'll let you take it away on, on maybe giving us an, an overview. Sure. So we, within our lifetimes, you and me and the viewers, will undergo a transformation here in the United States. It's never before been done by any human society on the face of the globe anywhere in recorded history. It's simply this. We will cease as a nation, as a society, to have one single identifiable racial majority in the overall population. So that's never happened before. But it's already started to happen, and you can see it right here in Hawaii. You can see it in California on many of our college campuses. It's driven by many factors. Migration is one of them. Birth rates are another. Mixed marriages, too. And this presents us with a choice, a dilemma. Will we embrace this with hope? Will we look at this and say, this changing face of America, what it means to be a real American, to look American, is a cause for joy, celebration. It's the American dream come true, this idea of the city upon a hill that beckons as an experiment in self-governance the world over. Or will we fear it? Will we be anxious? Will people be uncomfortable about the loss of privilege and position? Will they feel displaced when they wake up and suddenly all around them, instead of it look, look, looking like the 1950s version of Main Street USA, it looks like Honolulu? Mm -hmm. I mean, the US has always been ethnically diverse. And I think that this is something that we didn't notice and we don't represent that, that clearly. Um, but now, as you're saying, you know, the dem demographic change it's pretty imminent that we don't have a particular minority in, any, in the near future. Um, do you think that we are moving in the right direction as far as the, the, which path we're going to take as far as reacting to this? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm an optimist. I'm a believer in the American dream. And we have these great ideals, unlike any other nation. We've celebrated this idea. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what language your grandparents spoke, what faith they practiced what occupation they had. If you believe in this set of ideals, the civic culture that we have, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, due process, you can come here, you can become an equal, a member of the body politic, you can vote, you can even run for office, you can aspire to the highest uh, office of the land, and you can participate. That's a great ideal, and we've incrementally moved toward that. So at the founding of the nation, there was slavery. The Civil War changed that. The Constitution was amended, 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments abolished slavery and said if you were African American and if you were a person born in the United States, you were a citizen of the U.S. So that was one step. But we sometimes take steps backward. In 1882, Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act. It closed the doors. And the language that was used then was racist. Now, I don't mean by contemporary standards where I'm interpreting. I mean, if you go and look, mm -hmm. people just said, we don't like Chinese. So non-Chinese people, some of them immigrants themselves. So one of the leaders of this movement had come from Ireland, Dennis Kearney. Kearney Street in San Francisco is named for him. Mm -hmm. So he was a foreigner, but he didn't like Chinese specifically. Irish, he was OK with, but if you were Chinese, he didn't want you here. So Congress closed the door. And then about 20 years later, 25 years later, there was a nativist movement. And it again was explicit. They didn't hide what they thought, what they felt. They said they wanted to preserve old stock America, meaning white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestants. Mm -hmm. So it's not just that they didn't like people of color. They didn't like you if you were Italian. They didn't like you if you were Catholic or Jewish. They didn't like you if you were swarthy. 
So back then, the conception of race also was different. People actually spoke about the Chinese race, the Japanese race, the Italian race, the German race. They viewed uh, what we would call today an ethnicity as a racial group. Uh, so a law was passed in the 19 teens that set the quotas. So in addition to the exclusion of Chinese, which was extended to all Asiatics for a period of time, the U.S. had something called the Asiatic Barred Zone. You couldn't come here if you were from this zone, so almost all of Asia, except with a tiny, tiny quota. Uh, but in addition to that, the uh, rules were for all the other countries, European countries, there was a quota, and it was based on the proportion of that ethnicity inside the U.S. at the time the act was passed. Mm -hmm. That wasn't abolished until 1965. And in 1965, it was part of the Civil Rights Movement, and John F. Kennedy had been killed, and he had proposed this idea, so it was in part an honor uh, in his memory. Uh, Congress passed a new law that essentially opened the doors, not entirely fair even today, but it opened the doors to a much greater extent and to a much greater extent than any other nation. And that is what has brought us here today, is people have come to places you never would have expected. So it's not just Hawaii. If you look at the Asian population, and Asian Americans are now the fastest growing racial minority group in the U.S. The metro area where they've grown by percentage the most, Las Vegas. Las Vegas is now an Asian immigrant city. You, you wouldn't imagine that. And when you look at the entire US, the region that has experienced the heaviest growth in percentage terms, because they started at a lower level, is the Deep South. So you can go places where they had never seen someone with this color of skin, this texture of hair, this shape of eyes, as you and me, mm -hmm. 25 years ago, where suddenly, in the blink of an eye, they're ethnic neighborhoods. It's astonishing. The, the world changes at such a pace. This is accompanied by something else, though, and that's the ascendancy of Asia, the rise of China. People have real doubts now. Will the U.S. maintain its dominant superpower role? And there are many people from China, many people here in the U.S., who wonder, is China going to surpass the U.S. either as an economy or as a market for consumer goods. Sometimes people say to me, well, if that happens, you'll be all set because you're of Chinese descent, to which I say, not quite. It's going to be disastrous for me if that happens. It would mean every bet my family has made for three generations turns out to be wrong. My grandparents left mainland China for Taiwan. My parents left Taiwan for the US. They arrived here more than 50 years ago. And then I'm an assimilated American. When I last visited Beijing just a few months ago, a more senior uh, colleague who I was traveling with, also of Chinese descent, scolded me a little bit. He said, you really need to be careful. You don't want to come across as just some kid from Detroit, which is where <laughs> I grew up. And, and I thought to myself, yeah, I, I, I've made a mistake here because I am a kid from Detroit, right? When, whenever yeah. I visit China, I look around and realize, my mother was right, I should have paid attention in Chinese school, you know, because if China is ascendant, so this is what I explained to my white American friends, if they go to China and they can say, shisha, sha, people fall all, all over themselves, oh, you speak Chinese, that, that's great. If I open my mouth and say something in Mandarin, they shake their heads, they say, oh, you should be ashamed of yourself. You're, your Mandarin is really not very good. And <laughs> what kind of accent is that anyway? Right? So uh, the world has changed all around us. China has risen. And because of technology, something has happened. It used to be you had to be elite to be able to maintain mm -hmm. connections across the Pacific Ocean. Right. Now, with the internet, you can be working class and you can still be on WeChat, which is the Chinese version of Facebook and Twitter. And you can still be plugged into the same community. You can keep all the same friends. You can have the same social circle, even without a physical critical mass here in Honolulu or San Francisco mm -hmm. or Las Vegas. You're still part of a global transnational mm -hmm. culture. So all this has changed. But my grandparents left, my parents left, and I assimilated. Mm -hmm. And that's true here in Hawaii, too, when you think of local Asians, they're not the same as tourist Asians. Yes. Their behavior is different. 
the way they move, the language they speak. Uh, some of the foods are similar, right? They're comfort mm -hmm. foods we have in common. But so much of what here in the U.S. we think of as Chinese food is not really Chinese food. You can't get fortune cookies in China. Mm -hmm, right, right. Fortune cookies are Chinese American, and so many uh, dishes that people on the mainland think of as Asian are actually Hawaiian. You know, spam wow. masubi, you know, California rolls. They're, they're things that are invented mm -hmm. either in Hawaii or California that are unknown in China or Japan, right? And there's right, a right. mixing going on here that's unprecedented in human history. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, when we talk about this changing demographic that we're seeing in the U.S., uh, we're not just talking about yeah, groups that are, are really homogenous within themselves. That's the, that's the interesting thing. So we all have a history. Um, Hawaii is a good example where we have had a longer history of a strong, I think, representation of people of Asian descent here for a very long time. And, you know, but we have different layers of, of waves of people uh, arriving. No, that's absolutely right. And so there's a huge difference between, for example, the Japanese who were agricultural workers who toiled in the fields mm -hmm. on the one hand, and the Japanese who arrived as expats in the 1980s as investors, as temporary residents, both of Japanese descent. But by the 1980s, the Japanese Hawaiian population, the descendants of those who had worked in the fields as laborers, as farmhands, they were sansei, third generation. Mm -hmm. They were Americanized. They were Hawaiian. And yes, they had something in common, but often they didn't even have language in common. Mm -hmm. They didn't have faith in common because they had converted. But there's always been a back and forth. So this uh, is uh, an anniversary of Sun Yat-sen's uh, oh. birth. And some people know this. Sun Yat-sen spent significant time here in Hawaii. He was converted to Christianity. He went to, to schools here, he went to Iolani, and then he acquired ideas here because he lived with his brother that he took back to China. So in a way that I believe we should celebrate, uh, everything that happened in China that he was responsible for, his ideas, had American roots. They were adapted and changed, translated, if you will. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is not like a societies that were sealed off for a very long time, That's but right. now we just see it more intensified, the ability for exchange of ideas and for this kind of communication. I think that's a, is that something we hope to see more of, you think? It depends. I think it's great because this is what propels society forward, mm -hmm. and we're even more open here. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Frank. Uh, we're going to take a short break right here. So you're watching Global Connection at the Think Tech Live Streaming Network series. I'm Grace Chang, your host with Frank Wu. And stay tuned and come back in a minute. Welcome to Asia in the Wheel. Looking forward to see you next month on October 13, Thursday at 11 o'clock. Aloha, my name is Danelia, D-A-N-E-L-I-A. -E and I'm the other half of the duo, John Newman. We are the co-hosts of Keys to Success, which is live on ThinkTech live streaming network series, weekly on Thursdays at 11 a.m. Aloha. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Kaui Lucas, host of Hawaii is my mainland every Friday here on ThinkTech Hawaii. I also have a blog of the same name at kawilucas.com where you can see all of my past shows. Join me this Friday and every Friday at 3 p.m. Aloha. Hi, I'm Stan Energy Man, and I want you to be here every Friday. Noon, thinktechhawaii.com. Watch the show. Be there. I pity the fool who ain't. Welcome back to Global Connections. I'm your host, Grace Chang, and we're hosting uh, Frank Wu today at our program, talking about the changing face of America, Hawaii is the future. Okay. So um, Frank, your book, 
title is Yellow, Race in America Beyond Black and White. And we tend to think of race in black and white terms. Um, and we've been talking a bit about Asian Americans in this program. Do you, is, is that a, a strong composition in our American future? For, uh, or do we see other ethnic groups represented? I wrote the book to try to change dialogue. It makes just two points. As a law professor, it took me 400 pages to make two points. But the first is that race is not literally black and white. We often try to divide the whole population, just two boxes. And there are so many who are Latino, uh, who are Arab, who are Asian, who have mixed ancestry. Uh, and they have a lineage that dates back in this nation to a time before it was a nation. There are people of native ancestry whose lands these were. They belonged to uh, other peoples who were displaced, conquered, and that's a, a grievous wrong that we haven't acknowledged and owned up to. So uh, my point was very simple. It doesn't matter who you are. In other words, this isn't, isn't about ethnic pride on my part. It's not about Asians or Asian Americans. It doesn't matter whether you're liberal or conservative, so this is not about politics. It doesn't matter what sort of academic discipline you're in. Uh, my point was, if you want a picture of the world that's accurate, it includes so many colors, complexions, and you see that so clearly here in Hawaii. Everyone here knows far better than I do that when you look at the family photo on the mantle, you see every group represented uh, at, at every generation, and Hawaiians have reappropriated a, a term that was once derogatory, hapa, mm -hmm. for mixed, for half. And it's now, it, it's now to be embraced. It's now a new normal. So the margins have created their own mainstream. So that was my first point. Race is not just black and white. And if we're going to talk seriously, if we're going to have good public policy, we should recognize that, that, that this is just complicated. Mm -hmm. The second point is race is not figuratively, metaphorically, symbolically black and white. What I mean by that is we like to tell ourselves a story about race. It's a story of progress. It's triumphalist. You know, it's a, it's a positive, uplifting story. And that story is there were problems. Those problems were in the past. They were in the deep south. And we've overcome. We've become better. This is a story about villains on the one hand and victims on the other hand. So the villains are slave owners, slave traders. They're the Ku Klux Klan. They're skinheads. They're people who are vicious bigots, just open through and through. They say they're in favor of segregation yesterday, today, tomorrow, segregation forever. The victims are faceless, nameless, passive. They're not agents of their own destiny. They have violence visited on their bodies and, and the, the whole community. And, and I always try to be clear, don't get me wrong, there are villains. There are victims. But this story is not just about the past. It's not just about the South. It's about today. It's about mm -hmm. the North. It's about the West. It's even about Hawaii. Well, Hawaii has a history that until statehood or just before statehood, you know, Hawaii was a plantation economy dominated mm -hmm. by a handful of white-owned companies uh, in which people of color were second class. And that's just the history. You know, it's not uh, people today may not want to remember it, but that's the truth. And then uh, as people returned from World War II, in particular Japanese Americans, Japanese Americans who had fought for the United States, they were not interned in Hawaii as they were on the mainland, but Japanese Americans who had had a subordinate status then been enlisted as soldiers, given their lives or seen their family and friends give their lives, and women too joined the service, came back after World War II and they were empowered and there was a political revolution here. So uh, back to the main point, it's that race is not just clear-cut cases. Mm -hmm. So there are villains and there are victims, and I'm dedicated to fighting the villains and helping the victims. But there also are cases that are about structures, patterns of mm -hmm. conduct that uh, are about what psychologists call implicit bias. It's the, it's the images rattling around in my head, in yours. I'm guilty too when I walk down the street and I stereotype who might be a, 
a thug who might be dangerous. Sometimes you, you, you can't help it, and then you catch yourself. You realize with embarrassment, well, I, I just stereotyped someone when I crossed the other side. Um, I shouldn't have done that. That person could be, for all we know, an honors student at HPU, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, in talking about race, what I'm trying to do is get us to be more nuanced, to, to be more attentive to the subtleties, to the details, to the moment when someone says, where are you really from? Mm -hmm. As if to say, you can't be an American, or my, you speak English so well, because they're, <laughs> they're shocked. You know, my reply is, gee, thanks, so, so do you. Right. Uh, and all of this is happening in a place that has these great ideals. So everything I say, I say uh, as an American, as a believer in the American dream. I wouldn't be here if America hadn't opened its doors and welcomed my parents as students on scholarships. But I'm not a guest. I'm, I'm not temporary. I'm not transient. I was mm -hmm. born here. This is my home. It is where I intend to stay. And I will stand up and speak out and embrace that as not just a right or responsibility. So what I'm talking about here is that as the world changes around us, we are constantly struggling to live up to the ideals that we proclaim. And sometimes when I listen to, when I read angry bloggers or listen to uh, politicians running for office, I wonder if, if we even share the same ideals. Not everyone does. Some people would say, you are not an American. You cannot be. We don't trust you. Why? Because of where you came from because of how you worship, uh, because of something about you that isn't about you, it's about an image, a mm -hmm. stereotype that they have that's a generalization. So maybe someone of a similar ethnic background or similar faith did commit a crime or a terrorist mm -hmm. act. That person should be punished, but this guilt by association, that's what's troubling because it violates the ideals that we hold dear, that we are individuals, that we write the scripts of our own lives. We're not bound by stereotypes, and we should interact with each other in that way. That's what America stands for. That's what has made it great, this openness, this sense of reinvention, right? That's the American myth. Go West, young man, is about you travel West, you change your name, you learn a new occupation, and you become who you have imagined yourself to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you, you know, you talk about this uh, problem of, you know, people assuming that you have all of these characteristics based on how you look. And, I, you know, part of that has to do with, I think, our national imagination, you know, how different people are represented in the media in systematic yes. ways, how we talk about the topic of race and identity. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Like, how do we need to adjust as far as sure. how we dis talk about this issue? And These images are all around us. So when the kid comes up to me on the street, even today, and does karate moves, they do that because when they go to the movie theater or they turn on the TV, now it is changing just a little bit over time, in the past decade, let's say. But it used to be, what was it someone like me was doing on TV? Breaking cinder blocks with their head, right? Mm -hmm. It's Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, it's Bruce Lee, Jackie Chan. And so when I walk by and they say, yo, what's up, Bruce? You know, yeah. <laughs> that is uh, an allusion to an iconic figure, right? A martial arts superhero who died tragically, who, mm -hmm. who's become a myth. Uh, and it should be something that we celebrate, right? Mm -hmm. he, he was a breakthrough box office star, yet it's a way of mocking both Bruce Lee and mm -hmm. mocking every Asian American guy who happens to be walking down the street who may or may not know karate and kung fu and mm -hmm. so on. There's also a germ of truth, right? There's a germ of truth to many stereotypes. And sometimes I wonder for uh, Asians, for Asian immigrants, for Asian Americans, whether we live up to or down to the stereotype. So uh, I'll give you an example of what, what I mean. The stereotype has changed. When I was a kid, the stereotype of Asians was polite, 
submissive, deferential, passive, docile, you know your place. Now the stereotype is rude, pushy, aggressive, nouveau riche, busloads of tourists, uh, you know, uh, d just behaving badly at national parks and monuments or mm -hmm. uh, at high-end uh, stores. So, so the image has changed, but some of it has that germ of truth to it. So let's take the older stereotype of Asians, that we're polite and submissive and deferential. Well, you know, when I wanted to go to law school, be a lawyer, my parents discouraged that because they didn't think Asians could or should be making a fuss. You know, mm -hmm. they, they told me, don't mm -hmm. be controversial. You know, we, we don't do that kind of thing. You know, that's, that's not for us. Maybe blacks protest, they march, they carry signs, mm -hmm. they, they give speeches, they're angry. Not, not, not Asians, we, we, don't, we don't fuss that way, right? So, mm -hmm. and that was part of the culture that my parents came from. And I wouldn't be who I am were it not for them, so I have the utmost respect. But I wrote a blog a few years ago entitled, Everything My Asian Immigrant Parents Taught Me Turns Out to Be Wrong. Yeah. <laughs> it was right <laughs> Sorry, for <Mom>. them, <laughs> it was right for their generation, for their era, it worked, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but compare, so most East Asian cultures have a saying. There's a Japanese proverb, that, that's the clearest. It's the nail that sticks up is pounded down. Okay, now what's that about? That's about deference to authority, uh, to your elders, uh, fidelity to tradition. Right? There's, a, there's a Chinese phrase, um, the loudest duck is shot first by the hunter. Okay, same point, <laughs> the point of these sayings is do not put yourself out there. Compare that to the American adage, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Mm, different mm, attitude, very different, right? Yeah. So even today, sometimes I'll give a speech and I'll talk about legal issues and afterwards someone will come up to me, and they'll be Asian, and they don't want to file a lawsuit or make a fuss. Mm. They don't want to embarrass their boss, and I want to say, well, why not? Your boss is discriminating against you. Of course you want to embarrass your boss. So the moral of the story is the time has come for us to stand up and speak out and take our place. Mm -hmm. Yes, good point. Yeah, I mean, our culture is evolving, and, and part it's of being American changing. yeah, is, is uh, very individualistic and having the freedom to express ourselves. But we see that, uh, yeah, we have many traditions behind us and the many people. Um, so last question, do you think, we talked about HAPA, are we moving towards a HAPA future? It, it will what? be a HAPA nation. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, thank you very much, Frank, for joining us today. All right, so you have been watching Global Connections with me, your host, Grace Chang, and we've been talking to Frank Wu, professor of law at the University of California, Hastings College of Law. So see you next time. You can catch me here every Thursday at 1 p.m. Aloha. Thank you, Frank. Thanks. We're off. Yeah, okay. that went fast. Yeah, I it sure did. That <laughs> so that was live broadcast. Mm -hmm. So some people just saw it, just yeah. now. Uh -huh. okay. yeah. Yeah. And then it goes up on YouTube. And it'll be on YouTube okay. later today. Oh, yeah. no, that fast. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. I'll, yeah. I'll send it out to everyone. So yeah, uh, Nick, when Nick took your, your email, he'll send you the link. Okay. Right, thank you. Did that work out okay?